Okay, so I'm still Julius Krobocek, and I would like to tell you just a few things, to ask you a few questions about uh, configuration and networks. So modern routing protocols don't need any configuration. If you put Babel, if you put BMX7, if you put uh, OLSR on a router, you plug it in, it works. And that means that you can have a single image that you flash on all of your routers, and there is no necessity to do per-router configuration. You just configure it once for all. However, there is a link layer information. And this information, and that's a mistake, network layer information, and that is per-router. So you need to put different IPv6 addresses on your different routers. You need to uh, choose what are the attached network prefixes if you have uh, client interfaces. And that means that you have to log in to every single one of your routers by hand. And there is some more stuff that is per network. So for example, if you set up your DHCP servers with DNS information, then this information depends on which network. You cannot just take a flashed router and use the same image in a different network. And I don't see the bottom of my slide. Is that OK? Can you read here? And configuring such information manually is something that is labor-intensive and error-prone. And this is a French keyboard, and I hate French <laughs> keyboards. Uh, and that is a process that is labor-intensive inten and error-prone. And And so we've been, over the last decade or so, working on different solutions to this problem. And I think we don't have a good answer. The thing that most people appear to prefer is to have manual configuration when you do SSH into every single router, but with automatic monitoring. So it's still labor intensive because you have to log into every single router. But on the other hand, it's less error prone, because if you make any mistakes, they are detected automatically, and you have a dashboard somewhere where a big red light blinks and sends you SMS and turns off the hot water under your shower so that you will notice. The advantage is that in that case, the network is much more previsible. If you see an IP address, you know which router it belongs to. There's the BMX7 solution. I don't know, have you heard about BMX7? Some of you might have. And uh, the idea is to have everything integrated with the routing protocol. I'm simplifying, I know. Uh, so you get something that is secure, because the BMX7 people have done very serious work on security, that's fully integrated with the routing protocol, which is cool, but you get something that is fully integrated with the routing protocol, which is horrible. Because that means that you're specific to a single routing protocol, and that means that whenever you are changing the configuration stuff, you're afraid of breaking the uh, routing protocol, because things are within a single daemon, and then Axel will arrive to your house, and you're in deep trouble. A long time ago, I worked on a very simple auto-configuration protocol for mesh networks. It worked pretty well. It had the right properties. It was simple, but it has been abandoned because it didn't have some uh, features. Some people are working on recursive DHCP v6 prefix delegation. That's a mouthful. And recursive DHCP v6 prefix delegation is something that does work in some cases, but I'm not sure how well it works in mesh networks. And as the name shows, it is for IPv6 only. And I wasn't sure when I was writing whether I should put IPv6 only in red or in green. So that depends on your personal position. After HCP, uh, Marcus Stenberg, Stephen Bart, and what's the name of the French guy? Uh, I, don't, I hate not giving proper credit. Well, it will come back to me, so apologies to Pierre Fister. The, yeah. Uh, have done some amazing work on HNCP, and HNCP grew a lot from the initial design, because it was do being done at IETF. And when you do things at IETF, you have random people coming in and saying, but it doesn't solve my use case. 
still it works beautifully well. It's an ITF standard. It's powerful. It's secure. There are two independent implementations, which means that you can re-implement it from the spec. It is, unfortunately, a little bit complex. We have tried on a small network. It does work reasonably well in mesh networks. And if there are other solutions, I would like to hear about them. And I would really like to know if you're operating a mesh network right now, what is it that you would like for configuration? The answer we're happy with manual configuration is a perfectly accept acceptable answer to this question. Thank you for your attention. Does that work well? <laughs> I, I, I have, I ha there is very little experimental data to show that it works. Okay, so if it did work, I encourage you to, have a, to design a reproducible experiment <laughs> that shows that magic does work. So tomorrow I'm presenting a tool. The title of the talk is Custom Pseudo Firmware with OpenWRT Image Builder. So the idea behind it is that you uh, inject the configuration file on the, on the image that you flash. Uh, so if the configuration is right, you don't need to log to the router. And you have different methods to, to generate the image. You can do it with a YAML file that mm -hmm. you specify, because you can generate multiple images. So if you have to generate uh, 30 images, it will cost 30 per 5 seconds, then you have all of them, and you can auto provide them with uh, Ansible thing that I should end mm -hmm. at, in some time. And you also can provide forms so the users can generate the configuration. And this way, you can mimic any routing protocol you want because you what the process is taking the backup of a configuration file and extending or allowing some of the variables to be. Uh, change it, like for example the IP or the DNS. No? Mm -hmm. So you will have like image one, image two, image three with appropriate uh, values. So this is the approach I'm going working with BMX6 to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Which is basically a smart variant on point one. You're doing manual configuration, but instead of logging into every router, you have a script that does the manual configuration, and the point at which the configuration is manual is when you are flashing the right image on the right router. Yes. Right? Yes. So it's a variant on that. It's a smart variant on that, but it's still point case one. Plus a uh, mesh protocol. Yeah. So BMX6 or Batman Advance or anything else. Sure. So that's something that the people at the bring wireless, uh, like access points, do is having a controller. So basically what you do is that you plug your new antenna that you just bought, like uh, this kind of antenna, it gets an IP with DHCP, then it connects to a controller, and then the controller tells the antenna what should be this, confi this configuration. Mm -hmm. And then the antenna just changes IP address, configure a wireless access point, Whatever. And those people will be first against the wolf when the revolution comes. <laughs> Replacing decentralized technologies with something that is centralized, no, no torture is painful enough for them. I know, I know I'm an ideologue here. <laughs> no, we might agree, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm an ideologue. <laughs> So the problem you need to solve in this case is bootstrap. Because for a wireless access point, it's fine. I mean, you suppose you assume you already have a DHCP server, but on the, on the mesh network, you need basic connectivity so that your new antenna can communicate with the rest. Yes, it's but you can, you can do what BMX7 does, which is to draw randomly an IPv6 uh, site local address. And then you have the necessary configuration for network local communication. Okay. So that's pretty much solved with IPv6. Okay. Also, also on a server version 2 does it. Once again? Also on a server version 2. Yeah. Not, the, not OLSR, it's an extension. I don't remember seeing that in the protocol specification. It's implemented, so it yeah. might be a plugin. Okay, that well, might be in the. I, I'm kind of wondering about a, um, a constraint that I'm wondering if you're presenting it or not, or 
if you would expect one of these solutions to consume this constraint, which is some identifier. For example, you, you said that BMX7 will draw randomly, and then these other ones are kind of assuming that there's going to be a semi-random you know, single image, the node doesn't have a node number or anything, it's just a box, right? Yeah. And in the manual configuration, uh, you know, there's like the semi-manual where you load it at the end, so at least the image is unique, but uh, where do you draw the line with having to provide the system some number? Let's say you just gave it a node number, and it itself generates all its internal data. The reason being, if you wanted to like reflash a router and not have all the IPs changed so you don't even know where the node is, um, so where do you draw the line for So that's the trade-off I was speaking about sure. here. There is a difficult trade-off. On the one hand, you want as little human intervention as possible because we hate humans. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you do want to understand what's going on in your network. And if the IPs are chosen randomly or according to some algorithm, then it's very difficult to understand what's going on in your network. Mm -hmm. So. What BMX7 does, what HCP does, what AH HNCP do, is to draw the node identifier randomly in a sufficiently large space so that you have vanishingly small probability of a collision. Another solution, which is what Babel does by default, is to uh, generate the node identifier deterministically from the MAC addresses of the interfaces which means that as long as your hardware configuration doesn't change, the identifier is stable, which is useful for debugging. Okay, so yes, there is a trade-off here. Yeah. Something has to give at some point. Oh, I, I understand that. What I'm, what I'm wondering is, uh, maybe it's a question for the group, what is, you know, because you're asking what do network operators mm -hmm. wish, do network operators wish to have a semi exactly. or fully yeah. random solution to, to identifier creation? Or um, if you input something, how much is, so little of input that is considered as not manual labor, right? Like, let's say you said, okay, this is node five. And even if you replace the node with a different node five because the hardware broke, unless it breaks off, it's still node five. It's the same individual's site. So you are a network operator, sure. if I'm not mistaken. So what is your answer? I mean, I, I think that it's, I find it frustrating personally if the network is randomly chosen so that, I mean, it, it's okay, it's not, it doesn't, there's no need for control, that's not what I'm requesting, but uh, if it's like node 75AF is there, like, who is that today, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, not because I want to know the person, but because now it doesn't make sense that this thing is here. So I think it's interesting to have like at least, you know, semi-automatic style, so like, okay, this is node 12 or something like that, it makes sense. So you can kind of have a... So are you arguing in favor of an algorithm that does things automatically, but you can override its decisions? And if you say this guy who is node FE8357 right now, I want it to be called node 5, mm -hmm. and then the algorithm will reconverge with the additional constraint yeah. that this so node is node 5? algorithm is no problem. Um, I think that's, that's smart. And like, like what we do, we, we do it by a node number, and so this is node 10 or whatever. And if you need to add something else, then you should be able to not only override that number, or you can have it automatic, plus you can specify it manually, but also what about site-specific configurations? Like this one has two antennas or five antennas, or you know, we need an extra subnet over here or something. Mm -hmm. like, right? So I think doing something that allows for those additional flexibility, but keeping it so that you can auto-generate those things automatically, um, you know, algorithmically, in a smart way, is important. So otherwise you have to fight your tool to be able to do the thing that you want it to do. So now you create a tool, but you lock yourself into a corner. Now yeah, you, sure, now you can't of use course. It. No, the fact that it's you can override, so HNCP, AHCP allow overriding the decisions of the algorithm on a node by node. Uh, this is something I entirely agree with. If the operator knows better than the algorithm, then the operator should be able to insert high priority configuration data in the network. That's pretty obvious to me. Yeah. Question, what is the objective? To get short identifiers? Or no. to be able to say it's 007? I mean, no. Aren't we used today to like, 
hashes of public keys, or I mean, with all with all our chat tools, we are supposed to exchange some identifiers. Is sure. it so difficult to have a long identifier? No, no, I didn't say it was difficult to have a long identifier. I used the number ten or twelve as an example of a. Of a That's what's that an example. Less than, less than and what is the thing. advantage of being able to manually define the identifier? Sure, because now if if you're replacing the hardware or something changes with the node. You're not having it so that the node has disappeared and the new node has appeared, but now you don't know the continuance of this node to that node. Well, but then you can maybe copy the private key from one node to the other and have your old identifier. If it's a private key, but it's based on the MAC address, then it's different, right? Mm -hmm. So that there was a suggestion of auto generation based on something yeah. uh, you specify hardware, right? You specify private key. But what if you want, you know, copying the private key would be an example of how to manually override the identity because okay. it's you, you specified it. But what happens when you rotate your keys? Or which is good security practice. Yeah. Yeah. When you rotate yeah. your, keys. your keys. When you rotate the node identifier. I don't get the question. If your if your identity is based on the private key and you replace the private keys of everything for security purposes, the identifier the node is gone. That's true. Yeah. That's often the case. So then your whole network is yeah. completely different. Yeah. It is a difficult trade-off. I don't think there are any right answers. I'm trying to get a feeling about what people who actually do manage networks feel comfortable with. Uh, want to replace it then for security reasons, which then you talk about something that you're not talking about AHCP or the others, or do they have security combined with these identifiers? No, HMCP has security which is, uh, which is layered below the protocol. The security is not part the security answer, answer is distinct from the node identifier and agents. Yes, whenever you can manually configure it, you don't have security anyway. No security about that this address. You don't have security about the IDs. Sure. Yes. So um, then it's, it's like unfair to argue <laughs> not for security, security reasons I want to rotate my public keys with, yeah. I mean, because you don't have that in the other case this. anyway. Yeah, about yeah. public keys. Um, uh, what level are you interested to promote? Are you, you, you're referring to network player configurations or things that are uh, upper layers? So, uh, because, we, there, for instance, there are other monitoring and management tools mm -hmm. that generally propose that you have an IP and that you are reachable and that you have a key for to you and that you lock and that yes. you And as long as this works, then you can refresh them, you can reconfigure them with new firmware. Change it or just update them or whatever. But yeah, to have the network, to have the network running. Yes. So the, the question was are you interested to work on a network on layer 3 or layer 3 up? Or? Uh, so these solutions all work at layer 3 and up. Okay, however, they do work when your ne network is unnumbered. They use like local multicasts and stuff to configure your, your network. Okay, and the the question of knowing whether that's the right thing to do is an open question. My feeling is that we have failed with that work. HNCP has not been adopted by people. Okay, right now we're seeing that people are not using the auto configuration mechanisms that we have developed. Does that mean that they are happy with manual configuration? Does that mean that we are communicating badly? Does that need mean that we are solving the wrong problem? Okay, and I would like to start a discussion, perhaps not here, perhaps by private email later. I would like to start a discussion to understand what it is that network operators want. I don't have any answers to give here. I only have questions. I have more questions. <laughs> sure. When, from what we're saying, I got the impression, no, it's like, okay. I got the impression that one of the problems you could add is like, there's a new node that appears in your network, but you don't know why it is, right? You only know that it's connected to this other node and this other node, and it has this one node and not higher. That's, that's not such a huge problem. Okay. If a new node comes and then it stays for the next three years, but if, let's say, there's some node in the middle and now it's gone, and then another node appears, or if, or if I want to transfer, I want to replace the hardware, kind of transfer the config to a new one, you know, if I, if I must, 
have new addresses, and I've created kind of a, a gap in the network. Now there's a big change. I didn't just replace the hardware, I actually changed the configuration of the network. I had an outage, I replaced and stuff. People have a different expectation. They're oh, because you have to use yeah. And the local, the local server that somebody wants to use, you know, service on, it's a different address. Uh, everything is, so it's different, right? You have to repeat your last sentence, because yeah. something has been interfering. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I, I was just saying that if, if, uh, if you end up, uh, if you do this, you didn't just change one thing, you change like three things. The addresses are different, people's expectations are different, and if you have, say, a local service on the network, it's different address now. Right? So there's, there's a lot more that's changing because you have to update a lot of things across the world, not just, mm -hmm. you know, just yeah. like swap out one box and say, have that. Absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, you mentioned no numbers, why not names? Okay. Yeah, sure. So just a little note. I, I like a lot. Uh, I like it a lot. The Giphy approach of having a hierarchy, a hierarchy, a database hierarchy, saying this subnet belongs to this zone that is here. This subnet belongs to this zone that is here. Because uh, in terms of network operators, it's like internet. So it's e very easy to identify what's going on. Uh, what's going wrong? I'm very disappointed of that direction that routing protocols are, are taking of, um, um, of um, taking the MAC or generating uh, IPv6 randomly. I think this is very great to do a very fast testbed, but in terms of a very stable network, we need a database that could be decentralized that identifies exactly what are the nodes. If they want to be identified, I, I, I'm I would not maintain nodes that I know. I don't, I don't know node 6, node 7. These are maintained by anonymous volunteers, but I maintain nodes that I know where they are and I can contact them. So I need that this database approach or the real information is needed. And I, I see that this approach is being lost on all this mess. So I have one first reaction to what you're saying which is that configuration is separate from routing. Okay, it is a natural tendency to want to mix the two. Okay, that is what was initially done in HomeNet, where the configuration information was meant to be carried by OSPF. But by merging the two together, you create something. I know we can polemize about that. I know you disagree. We can polemize about this later. Uh, by doing a single protocol that does everything, you end up with something that is too complex for people to understand and modify. So my argument here has always been that we want a separate protocol that's independent of the routing protocol and ideally should be routing protocol agnostic. H HCP, H HNCP, recursive CPV6 PD, they all work whatever your routing protocol. Okay, and conversely, for different needs, we might have different configuration protocols used with the same routing protocol. So when you said you don't like the direction the routing protocol is taking, I would say that's not the routing protocol, that's the configuration protocol, which is separate from the routing protocol. The second point is, uh, that's the trade-off we were mentioning before. I think that there are different needs depending on what kind of network that mesh network operators, I would expect them to want to be able to configure things manually. And so it's not a white or black answer. There is somewhere the right trade-off that people will feel comfortable with. And I think we need to look very carefully where this trade-off lies. Uh, that's what I was getting off with, how much information do you, is like a, a small enough amount that it's not manual, it's maybe, you do have to specify it so it's manual, but uh, given that people might want to configure something manually anyway, uh, where's the trade-off that it, that's still considered maybe automatic if it's some small data, right? A key or a name or a number, something like that. So you would be happy with a system in which IPs are assigned automatically with no control, as long as you have a database that matches your node, na your node name to the IP addresses. I don't know if I would call it a database, but if you had like, a small math function like we do, a small Python thing that shift this bits over, shift those bits over, and this is the node number, cool. 
then you know how to get to where you want to go. As long as you don't have collisions. As long as you don't have collisions, right? So you have to assume this. In my case, I would need more information. For me, it's not enough a number. You still have to put the notes somehow first. Nobody uses it. <laughs> That's the tragedy. We spent two years of our life working, implementing, designing, testing, and simulating HNCP, and nobody uses it. The plan has been to promote it to home router vendors so that you would buy, you know, your Linksys home router and it would already run HNCP and so if you plugged in into your home network extra HNCP nodes everything would get configured automatically okay and uh, we've been hopelessly bad at communication the worker the home net working group has been hopelessly bad at communication and uh, and uh, because of that it's not clear whether nobody is interested because we're bad at communicating or whether it's because it is not filling a real need. I, my personal opinion, don't quote me on that, is that if it really answered a real need that the router's vendor have, they would implement it, notwithstanding our bad communication. Were they involved in the development? Difficult to say. There were router vendors at the meetings. I have the impression, and I happen to know, that they do have in-house implementations. They're just not putting them in products. But you are one of the designers of AHAP, huh? No, I was the first independent implementer. So I was involved in the discussions, but the implementers are Steven, Marcus, and Pierre. And when RFC is not for you? The RFC, it was? I'm not a co-author. I'm acknowledged, but I'm not a co-author. There are two RFCs that describe the protocol in excruciating detail. So one last. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to. Uh, you said something earlier that was kind of interesting. You asked about. I, I thought about it for a couple minutes. You said, "Why not note names? Why note numbers?" And there was also this comment about why not a long string instead of a short string, right? Or a short number, I mean. Sorry. Um, and something that comes to mind, and I might get shot for this by all of you guys, but uh, I think it's, in, it's important today, uh, maybe not in 10 years, but important today to be able to support IPv4 automatic selection. And I know it's a legacy, sure, but people use it, and it's, it's almost a necessity still. And so if you have too long of a name or a number, then it's a little bit difficult to have, because you have this huge address space, you have to span IPv4. So what do people think about? Do they want IPv4 still, all of, all of you guys? Or do you feel that you want your IPv4 auto allocation to go, come from one of the, not the whole RFC 1980 so space? Or? IPv4 is dead in four years, and it has been dead in four years for as long as I can remember. Okay, so we should expect that we will have IPv4 in our networks for the foreseeable future. Okay, that's just assuming that the past is a good predictor of the future. So, here, IPv4 and IPv6 are generated differently. IPv4 is negotiated. IPv6 is determined algorithmically, as you envision. Here, both IPv4 and IPv6 are negotiated across the network. And there is no relationship between the node identifier and the IPv6 address. Okay, so there are many multiple approaches uh, which don't necessarily involve using the node name or node identifier in order to generate the IP address. Sure, I, I get that. Um, what I'm getting at is that, in, in, especially in the v6 case, there's definitely a huge positive and a huge ability to do randomized selection because your chance of collision is very low and you have this really giant address space under which to, to generate randomly over it, right? With V4, assuming we're going to have V4, we can put the argument off the table, it will be there. Um, do we, you know, you need at least a, you need a much smaller address space in which you can randomize over. So even if you do do something random, you don't have 
you know, many tens or hundreds of thousands of options, you only have many thousands of options. And so using a string or something else, or like your, your ability to do something really clever shrinks because yep. you, yeah. so what, what do you think about that, especially for, is that so what again. seems obvious to me is that if you use a node name, then the node name and the IP address have no relation whatsoever. Right, which means that now okay, there is a difference between the identifier and the address. Right, they so are completely means, distinct so concepts. That that, you know, what I'm asking is, with IPv4, if you have no bearing on the node identifier to the address space, then you almost have to have manual or remote configuration versus automatic configuration. So that's kind of that's why not that's not the case. It simply means that when you notice a collision, you have to renumber. So what happens in HNCP is that the node, the addresses are generated randomly, announced before they are used, and if there is a network merge, then one half of the network needs to renumber. Okay, that's a pretty much a solved problem. I guess uh, I was assuming one more constraint, which is the earlier one I gave, where the network's not flapping randomly. Once again? I guess that I assumed one earlier constraint where the network's not flapping randomly. If you want your nose to have a semi-constant identifier, and I would be four, it doesn't collide, then you have less options, right? You kind of, if, if it's an integer, then you can generate something, but if it's like a, a name, then it's gonna be difficult to generate a fixed, algorithmic selection of a V4 address over a non-infinite space. And you kind of require manual or small range of identifiers. I think we should take, judging from the heavy silence, I think we should take this discussion offline. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Julius. Thank you. Thank you.